In the first half of the course, we talked about transportation planning, how you might decide where a road or transit line might go, and we had a four-step transportation planning model. You will recall trip generation, destination choice, mode choice, and route choice. So where do we see queues in real life? In route choice, we had link, link performance functions, which said how the travel time on a particular road segment varied with the number of vehicles using that road segment. The relationship looks like this typically, with travel time on the y-axis and flow in vehicles per hour on the x-axis. This is essentially saying that the user of the link receives the average experience of somebody who's using that link during the hour. But of course, it's like talking about the man who drowned in an average of one inch of water. He didn't drown in one inch of water. The water was concentrated in one place and less concentrated in another. The travel time isn't uniform across the hour. It varies. At the beginning of the pink period, if there's no standing queue, travel speed might be pretty close to free flow. But if more traffic arrives in that hour than can be accommodated by a facility, the queue gets longer and longer and longer, and that is reflected in higher travel times and lower speeds. If we're trying to look at things from a more microscopic perspective, if we want to get better measurement of how travel time works on transportation facilities, or really any kinds of facilities where there's this kind of queuing process going on, we need to understand queuing processes. As a brief distraction, it is said that queuing is the only common word with five vowels in a row. There is a made-up word, all words are made up by somebody, but archaeolotropic, which has six vowels in a row. But really, you don't use that very commonly. I mean, you might not use the word queuing very commonly yet, but you'll start to use the word queuing a lot. This was just a brief side note. We have queues everywhere. We say it's a transportation thing, but it happens in all sorts of systems. It happens in transportation systems, most obviously when you're waiting at a traffic light or you're waiting at a ramp meter. Queuing explains why buses come in bunches. But it happens in supermarkets as well as transportation, as you are moving your goods through the checkout line. The supermarket checkout line is like a ramp meter. It's like a ramp meter that is irregularly timed because the person in front might take a different amount of time than the next or previous shopper, where only one person can go through on green. There may be stochasticity or randomness, not only in how many people come into the queue, but how quickly the queue is discharged. We want to think about this as a physical model. At a ramp meter, the traffic light changes every two seconds. That is deterministic. Every four seconds from red to green at a regular rate. At a supermarket checkout counter, it is an irregular rate at which it changes. That's what we call stochastic. Vehicles often arrive at the back of the ramp meter at an irregular rate, and we may model it as a random process. Or it might be in pulses, because there might be a traffic signal upstream of that light, or of the ramp meter light, which changes from red to green every 30 seconds. Then when it changes to green, a whole bunch of cars, what we call a platoon, come onto the ramp and then are waiting on the ramp to get discharged onto the freeway. There's a queue to get a contract parking space at the Washington Avenue parking ramp. When I first came to the University of Minnesota, I put my name on a waiting list to reserve a parking space at the University of Minnesota's Washington Avenue ramp. Four years later, they contacted me and told me that the parking space was available. Did I want it? This was a four-year long queue. It was a queue. It was a regular process. I turned it down because I was walking to work at that point. I probably should have kept it and sold it to somebody because it's a valuable commodity, closer to the center of campus than most other parking ramps. How are customers served? There are several methods. First come, first serve, also called first in, first out, differs from last in, first out. A ramp meter is an example of a first in, first out process. Whoever got to the ramp meter first goes to the front of the queue. Then whoever came next goes behind them, and so on. Then the person at the front of the queue is the first one to leave. A ferry might be an example of a last in, first out process. The first cars entering the ferry are loaded in the front of the vessel. The last car to get on the ferry is going to be closest to the doors letting cars, letting cars off the ferry, so they're going to be exiting first. I don't know if there is a race to be last on ferry boardings. I would not be surprised if there were. On airplanes, they used to board the back of the plane first. They'd say, people in rows 40 to 50, please board. And then they'd say, people in rows 30 to 40, please board. In the U.S., when you deplane the airplane, you deplane generally from the front door. So it's pretty much an order of the order of the rows. Whoever's the first row deplanes first, and the second row deplanes second, and so on. So that's a last in, first out process. And airlines have changed this because it turns out that the most efficient way to board an airplane, and people are just too noisy and random anyway. And there are other ways to deplane, to have people exit an airplane. If you look at how it is done at, say, in Israel, they have the airplane parked not next to the building, but on the tarmac, and they have stairs from multiple doors. 
people leave the airplane not just from the front door, but what we think of as the emergency exits. They open those up, they put a staircase next to it, and they can unload an airplane a lot faster. Then people walk from the tarmac into the building. The security people there, because this is Israel, making sure that people are walking where they're supposed to be walking. We get people off an airplane much faster that way, but it's a different configuration, so there are trade-offs. Different systems have different processes. There are even priority processes. At an HOV by bypass ramp on a ramp meter, you have a ramp meter and then you have a, a lane parallel to it for high occupancy vehicles, which can bypass the queue. They can, what we call, jump the queue. Priority is given to HOVs because the average value of time of an HOV is higher than the average value of time of an SOV, a single occupant vehicle. If we assume that all people have the same value of time because a high occupant vehicle is carrying more people than a single occupant vehicle. A bus carrying 30 people and every person is worth $15 an hour, that implies a lot more money than a single occupant vehicle carrying one person who we also give a value of time of say $15 an, average, um, an hour on average. We give priority to certain types of vehicles. In Minneapolis and St. Paul, the light rail transit lines have traffic signal priority. So they stop less or not at all at red lights that affect cars. The idea is that an LRT train carries more people, so it should have priority. There's similar talk about doing that for buses, what is sometimes called rapid bus or arterial bus rapid transit. In the real world, we don't know the arrival and departure or service distributions with certainty. We might know the statistical distribution of them, but we don't always know deterministically. So we need to deal with queues that might have randomness in their arrivals and or randomness in their departures. If the randomness is small, then we can approximate them with deterministic queues and not be too far off. We can think about arrival distributions. How do people arrive at the back of the queue? Service distributions. How do people depart from the front of the queue? We can characterize queues in different ways. Is the queue finite or infinite? That doesn't mean does the queue go to infinity now, but it could it go to infinity theoretically, or is it somehow constrained? The waiting list for the Washington Avenue ramp could potentially go to infinity, at least a very, very large number. We can model a waiting list as if it's infinite. In contrast, at a ramp meter, an on-ramp might only hold a finite number of vehicles. It might only hold 40 vehicles, and the 41st vehicle would spill over onto the arterial. There might be a rule that you can't wait on the arterial to get onto the ramp, so some queues are finite. The math for finite queues is harder than the math for infinite queues. How many channels does the queue have? How many lanes are there? At a supermarket, there might be 12 lanes, or a big supermarket, there might even be 24 lanes. At a ramp meter, there might be only two lanes, but they function as one lane. At a McDonald's, there might be six cash registers open. At a traffic light on a one-lane road, there's only one lane. We cannot say that all the lanes are uniform. Again, it depends on whether the queues are deterministic or random. But if there's randomness in the system, then the number of lanes allows people to switch between lanes potentially and make the system move a little bit more efficiently, depending on how we're modeling the queue. What is the arrival rate? The number of vehicles arriving at the back of the queue, we denote that with A of T or lambda. We have departure rate or service rate, which we call D of T or mu. Then we can think about whether we're in saturated conditions or unsaturated conditions. If lambda is greater than mu, we are oversaturated. There will always be queuing. If lambda is less than mu, there may or may not be queuing, depending on how close in practice lambda is to mu. And there's some probability of queuing because if there's randomness in the system, even if the system can serve 1,800 cars an hour, one car every two seconds, and only two cars an hour arrive, if those two cars in the hour arrive at exactly the same time, one of them will be delayed. The probability of that happening is pretty small, but it's not zero. To illustrate, imagine we discretize arrivals so that each arrival occurs within a two-second window. If two or more cars arrive in the same window, at least one will be delayed. With only two cars in an hour, there is a 1 in 1,800 chance that those two cars will arrive in the same window. The probability that both arrive in one particular window is, of course, much smaller. On the other hand, if this line can serve 1,800 vehicles an hour and 1,700 vehicles an hour arrive, there's a high likelihood that some of them will arrive at the same time and be delayed.